Piura is uh, an area on the northern part of Peru. We are about 500 kilometers south of the equator. Uh, it used to be a dry woodland, very delicate ecosystem. And due to overgrazing and uh, using the trees for wood, for cooking, it has become a desert. When we purchased this land, it was overgrazed. It was 98% um, sand. It's 0.3% of organic matter. Very, very low um, productivity in that sense. The amount of rain that we get usually, it's about 80 millimeters a year. In 2014, we planted the first 40 hectares of grapes. Everything was going really well the first two years. And in 2017, we got hit by El Nino. During El Nino, we got about 30 inches of rain in 45 days. So actually, this whole area was flooded. And after that, Something happened with the soil, salts from the chemicals and the conventional nutritional system did something to the roots of the plants and after that in 2018-2019 the productivity just went down. It's very difficult to have a monoculture and be able to build again the resilience that we had at the first two years in the plants. And that's when we started to realize that the conventional system was not giving us that resilience for these extreme weather conditions. So we started like a trial with organic bananas. We thought that was going to be an easier crop to manage. And that's when we started to see big changes on the soil and in general, the diversity of the system started to show up. So we continued doing research through the web and I was following um, Dr. Elaine Ingham and the Soil Food Web from my interests on improving the soil and everything that we were seeing in the banana fields. I was thinking of getting into her course, but I wanted a fast track improvement. So we decided to hire one of their consultants. Uh, Terraforma was doing some work in Ecuador, in a, actually in a banana field. We decided to call them. They came right away and and we started the, the project immediately in 2019. I've been a consultant for six years, working on a number of different crops and all around the world. We have projects in India, we've worked in Brazil, Mali, in the Philippines, the US, Ecuador, Peru. So, you know, over those six years, we've had the opportunity to trial these processes across different landscapes, different crop systems. We really get the sense that we're making improvements on these farms for the people that are working on them, uh, the owners of the farms, uh, as well as producing healthier, higher quality food, which is something that, you know, it's hard to replace in terms of feeling very good about. Agropira was a farm that reached out to us, really struggling to work within a conventional system. They never really were able to recover from that El Nino year. So when I showed up on the farm, it was essentially a sandbox. The yields were quite low, so we were able to see a very strong turnaround in the yields that we were able to achieve after we started implementing biology back into the fields. Uh, we were able to see over 100% yield increases in these areas, and the second year we saw again about 100% yield increase on top of that. So we've seen continued increases over time and continued improvements in the field. In cuanto a crecimiento, tamaño, tipo de racimo, número de racimo, El resultado ha sido bastante positivo. Hemos tenido este año 1 a 2 milímetros más de diámetro de valla. Hemos tenido buena elongación de racimo. Eh, hemos estado en el peso promedio, igual como un racimo convencional. When we go to a client's site, what we're typically trying to do is follow up on different trials and practices that we've been working on with their team. So we'll often work with the farmers to build in new ideas or trial new products or different systems. And we implement those slowly over time. So starting with a smaller area where we'll design a trial with their team and give feedback on where we think that things can be done a little bit better or a little bit differently to get the optimal result. In Agropira specifically, we've done a lot with a notion of cover plants or cover plants that are underneath the grapevines in order to help fix nitrogen, reduce erosion, build organic matter, 
increase the fungal biomass through plants that better associate with fungal microorganisms and really try to get that baked into their system and reduce the fertilizer usage and herbicide usage to a point where it's no longer needed. Nematodes hit your productivity very hard because they go into the root system and we were getting not even 8,000 kilos per hectare because of the nematodes. We were able to improve the soils just with cover crops. So using certain cover crops that exudate chemicals that make those nematodes to go away has made quite a big difference. And much cheaper than conventional chemical inputs that doesn't work because the next year the nematodes become resilient to the chemicals. So at the end of the day you keep putting chemicals and different chemicals and, and every year you still have the problem. And then we found out that sweet potatoes were a wonderful cover crop because they can stay over the trellis permanently. We don't have to prune it or reseeding it. So we can maintain it and manage it uh, basically parallel with the different phenological stages of the grapes. So they are a very good companion crop. Hoy en día vemos una diferencia grande trabajar con el tema de materia orgánica de con biostimulantes. Hemos obtenido una buena masa radicular. Tenemos una competencia de nematodo. Todo parte de la relación suelo planta y raíz. Si no tenemos una buena masa radicular, no vamos a tener un buen follaje y tampoco vamos a tener buena producción. Hay que tener un equilibrio en el tema suelo, planta y producción. We're also working with cover plants in the roadways, essentially, in order to reduce the amount of dust that's getting kicked up as they're driving through the fields. Because the tractor goes by and it's cover crop, so there's much less dust. And dust is probably one of the biggest issues we have here because it brings other things. The next challenge was, well, how are we going to prune this? How are we going to manage all these cover crops? And that's when uh, we started looking at different alternatives like sheep. Sheep help to control the weeds, help to cycle some nutrients that way. It's a kind of a different way and a more regenerative way to control weed pressure instead of using manpower. It definitely helps to reduce chemical usage. It has been also another wonderful experience. It's added life to the, to the farm. It's, brings happiness to the people. So now you have cover crops, you have the grapes, and you have the sheep, and they all have to be tied in into the management. And that's a trick thing. We have to find the right balance. We collect their manure, which also helps in our compost. We also continue to make compost and vermicompost with them to amend the fields to create humic acid extracts. We do all our extracts here, and that has also helped a lot on reducing our costs. Our inputs are coming down. We are finding local inputs. So instead of bringing CO2 from Europe or India or China, we are trying to make the farm produce its own inputs and bring less from outside. We have the fish hydrolysate. Uh, which is a high amino acid, free amino acid product that we can utilize to stimulate microbiology in the soil, um, as well as utilize foliar for some absorption of different amino acids. We also implement integrated pest management, where we're rearing insects on site that we can release into the fields and that can survive in some of the associative cover plants to help control pests and disease. Some of those main goals that we faced early on were getting rid of herbicides, which we succeeded in, getting rid of fungicide, getting rid of insecticides, which we've managed to do, and then also converting off of synthetic fertilizer, which we're now using zero synthetic fertilizer as well. So we've hit the goals of making this farm 100% organic, and in doing so, increasing the yield from 2019 to 2022 by over 200 percent. We've been able to see very large increases in bacterial biomass going from very low numbers in the hundreds to over 400 micrograms per gram in the soil. The fungal biomass went from being uh, a much smaller percentage, less than the bacteria, to now we have areas with over 1,000 micrograms per gram of fungi in the soil, which has gone a long way to help balance the fungal to bacterial ratio. It's not as though everything is exactly perfect. We do face different problems year on year. Um, last year we had problems with mealybugs. This year we've come up with solutions to deal with the mealybug issue, but now we have problems with powdery mildew. 
So every year there is a challenge, but researching, following the soil food web with miles, we are able to always find a solution. Tenemos tres muestras, probablemente un mezcla de organismos similar de este mismo punto. They've really dedicated themselves to making this change. And those are the best results that you'll ever see is when you have somebody you're working with who's very dedicated to the process, who does some of their own research, who encourages their managers to kind of learn on their own to try new things and really pushes to wean their way off of chemical implements. It's not about products, it's about management. So if you don't have the people that understand what they're doing, then it's not going to work. I mean, everybody has to be on board. And that's the challenge, how you get them on board. A lot of the managers on the farm took quite a bit of convincing. So Roberto and I would do a lot of educational support for the team, trying to help them understand why we're trying to do the things that we're doing, and also helping to design trials and involve the team in a way where they could see directly the result of everything that was happening. Today, the mindset of, of the people at the farm, they don't want anything to do with chemicals. I don't have to convince them. Now they convince me of certain things. Every conventional farmer that makes a shift towards regenerative farming has to go through that process of educating their workers and their managers, learning and failing and learning and failing, uh, and going through that cycle of, of bringing a program along. You can make improvements to soil health within a standard conventional system. You can make improvements to your workers' health, to the quality of the food in systems where you're still using some synthetic fertilizer or you're still having some of those chemical tools as backups. It's difficult for farmers to be able to take risk because one bad year can throw them into financial ruin. They can lose their farms, they can completely go bankrupt. So that's why farmers tend to be more cautious with taking on big changes. And that's something that I completely encourage, right? You don't want to make a huge change and lose the farm or have something go wrong. So it's important to take those experimental steps and really start to move in that right direction. You don't have to be 100% organic, but at least treat your soil in a nicer way, you know? Give your plant the ability for them to be resilient, for them to be healthier. It's much cheaper, it's much more productive, and it's much more fun, <laughs> really. We would love to be an example on how large-scale production sites can be organic and can be diverse and very productive and a very good business investment. And it will be nice to see more of this. Bringing Miles and Terraforma and the Soil Food Web on board has been probably one of my happiest and best decisions. I think it's a great thing to have these advisors. They add value, tremendous value to, to the business. And even though we have already a very good system, we will continue with them because it's a never-ending research. They are part of the team.